Hello and welcome to a new season of Interpreting India. Geopolitical realignments, sustainable growth, healthcare financing, inclusive digital transformations, climate change, supply chain disruptions, urbanization, and several other critical global matters envelop the world as India holds the G20 presidency. We at Carnegie India continue to bring voices from India and around the world to examine the role of technology, the economy, and international security in shaping India's future. I'm your host, Suresh Rai. And this week, I'm joined by Rahul Verma to discuss a recent essay in which he argues that the claims of democratic backsliding in India are somewhat exaggerated. <laughs> Rahul is a fellow at the Center for Policy Research and a visiting assistant professor at Ashoka University. His research interests include voting behavior, party politics, political violence, and media. He's a regular columnist for various news platforms and has published papers in Asian Survey, Economic and Political Weekly, and Studies in Indian Politics. His book, co-authored with Professor Pradeep Chibber, Ideology and Identity, The Changing Party Systems of India, develops a new approach to defining the contours of what constitutes of an ideology in multi-ethnic countries such as India. He has a PhD in political science from the University of California at Berkeley. In recent years, many international indices and rankings that evaluate the state of democracies have downgraded India's democracy. There are, however, significant differences in the degrees of downgrading. The Economist Democracy Index, for instance, has indicated that even though there has been some backsliding, the Indian democracy remains in the same band as it was earlier, what they call a flawed democracy, which in their classification is better than hybrid regimes, but worse than full democracies. In its latest report, it ranks India 46 out of the 167 countries it considers. But the varieties of democracies or VDEM index now places the state of Indian democracy at about the same level as it was during the emergency. It is classified as an electoral autocracy, which is a type of hybrid regime. In its latest report, VDEM ranks India 107th out of 179 countries. These differences notwithstanding, all the major indices and rankings suggest that Indian democracy is backsliding. On the other hand, in India, voter turnouts have increased, voting patterns have changed significantly with new alignments emerging, people have continued to participate actively and vociferously in politics, which suggests high political efficacy. The party that seems dominant as a center has lost several elections at state and local levels. And survey after survey has shown that a vast majority of people in India are satisfied with the working of democracy. All these are signs of vibrancy of Indian democracy. And this discussion, we will try to make sense of the dichotomy. But before we start the discussion, I would like to make two points. The first point is worth keeping in mind is that this debate in India is happening in a global context of a debate on democratic backsliding. Political scientists are making important contributions to this debate with some suggesting that there is no democratic backsliding happening globally and others suggesting that there is. If you look closely at that debate, we see that it really depends on the measures one considers to assess the health of a democracy. In a recent debate, one set of scholars <laughs> considered what they presented as more objective indicators to conclude that there has been no backsliding, while other scholars co countered that with, uh, by saying that there is backsliding. Second point I want to make as a by way of background is even at the best of the times, it is very difficult to make an objective assessment of how well a complex polity like India is doing as a democracy. Two persons can pick their own sets of preferred facts and come with radically different narratives on what is going on. At any point of time, the state is taking some actions that seem undemocratic. And at the same time, we see democracy improving, voting patterns improving, the technology of voting improving and so on. So assessing the net change is not so easy. Rahul has made uh, multiple contributions to these debates, most recently in an essay published as part of the five essays collection in the Journal of Democracy. Rahul has uh, offered a critique of the narrative of democratic backsliding in India. The essay is called The Exaggerated Death of Indian Democracy. In this conversation, we will look to understand this critique and then get his views on the state of Indian democracy. Rahul, welcome to Interpreting India. Thank you, Suyesh, for having me. Let me start with an open-ended question. What prompted you to write this essay? Other than the fact the editor asked you to write it. <laughs> Many things. Uh, uh, I actually have been working on a longer set of essay uh, and uh, with a co-author of mine, which we presented last year at a conference, where what we tried to do, because some scholars have been saying that there is a fundamental shift in Indian politics post-2014. And what I saw that most people who are trying to comment on it first, a large part of this commentary in just in opinion pages, so very short articles and from different vantage point. 
Uh, and even those who have attempted a slightly, slightly longer uh, piece on this, again, it has like one angle uh, and, and those angles are different, but only one angle. And so what, and, and some people like Yogen Riyadh uh, 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 and, and others have indicated that India is basically moving to what they call as second republic, right? And so that, that large essay with a co-author of mine basically tries to look at these changes, multiple changes, and tries to conceptualize or theorize what Second Republic looks like. Uh, and the idea behind that essay was like one, if, if, if I have to summarize in one line, that we are indeed in a moment of transition, right? Uh, and, and the full contours of that transition is not visible. And there are contradictory forces and paradoxical things that are happening at, at this moment. And without understanding some of those paradoxes about our uh, churning, we won't be able to explain the current moment. So that is a larger uh, theme we were working on. Uh, of course, uh, a part of that uh, larger essay got published in uh, one platform. And I also got a lot of pushback uh, from some of my friends on, on that essay that what does this essay mean? Uh, and that started <laughs> got me thinking that perhaps uh, my own argument, uh, uh, what I'm thinking in my head and what came out in that essay is a bit convoluted. And so if one has to take a position at the moment that whether uh, in, in there is a democratic backsliding happening or not, on that particular question, one has to be much more direct mm -hmm. rather than basically uh, uh, presenting a more convoluted and <laughs> complex argument, which is not to say that I, I, I wanted to lose the nuance of the moment. Uh, but the argumentation had to be much more direct. What do I mean uh, when I either like I argue in favor of a democratic backsliding argument or I present a more nuanced critique of it? Uh, to just conclude uh, this answer, I'm not at all, <coughs> even in the essay in Journal of Democracy, I'm not at all saying that there are no areas of concern. And to give you perhaps some would, some may, would basically call it a bad analogy, right? So, yes, if you think of Indian democracy as some human body, uh, the body slightly, like, you know, uh, is under the weather. Now, weather under the weather means that you just need to visit a physician <laughs> and, and get some checkups done. Or the under the weather basically means you to get into the ICU and, and meet direct surgical operation. I think that's where the disagreement uh, lies with, uh, like, people uh, who's, who are arguing that yeah. uh, democratic backsliding exaggerated or those who are saying that there is backsliding happening. So I did read your previous essay also and this, this one also. In the previous essay when I read it, it seemed like you're suggesting that this is a serious case and we need to go through a major surgery and 50-50 chance of survival. And this one seems like even if you go to a general physician and administer a couple of... Uh, <clears throat> medicines you can you you, you will find uh, so in the essay you uh, basically make three sets of arguments one important argument that uh, i thought you made you made is to take a historical lens and through that see the present moment and you argue that in the much of commentary on democratic backsliding in india there seems to be what you call a recency bias that uh, many of the commentators seem to be arguing from the perspective of the uh, coalition era that we did have a quarter century of a coalition era in that things seemed to be working in a particular way because no party had achieved uh, domination at the national level uh, coalition used to form governments and they were always uh, the grip on power was always a little tentative and now there is a dominant party that has risen so if you were to just explain that argument a little bit in terms of what is the history of Indian kind of party systems and how should we place the current moment? And we, what in the past can we compare it with? What is the closest that moment in the past that comes to the present moment? Okay. Uh, so first point on that uh, previous essay, which you read and also commented on, uh, is if you like in that particular essay, I didn't use the word uh, democratic backsliding at, at all, right? Uh, what I was basically trying to do in that essay is basically make two sort of like highlight the two paradoxes. One paradox is basically what's happening at the moment is that democracy in some sense, especially in the electoral realm, 
is expanding and widening, right? There is much more participation. So what would turn out is high, more parties are competing. Uh, elections have become much more normal, even at the local level, uh, the panchayati systems and, 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 and many more people are contesting. Uh, people who are also getting into share like political power, that uh, has also widened, uh, even if it's in rhetoric. Uh, uh, if you remember this government, like in last cabinet expansion, made sure that they make this point that we have got so many SCs, so many STs in cabinet. So in some senses, uh, uh, India's political power uh, is, is getting much more diversified compared to past. But at the same time, we are also seeing uh, these negative tendencies in Indian politics where more people, more politicians who have alleged criminal linkages, mm -hmm. more business uh, people with business and uh, like high wealth, uh, political parties <laughs> are getting centralized. Right. So, so think of the contradictory tendencies. Uh, these political parties are able to mobilize more people and get more people into political power, but they them, in themselves are also becoming undemocratic with where it is controlled by just a single family. So I wanted to, uh, you know, document those two uh, sort of paradoxes much more. But while writing those two paradoxes, I also mentioned some of the things that are happening uh, in, in the current context uh, that institutions are under stress. I, I like, and, and some of those might have given a very different uh, version and, and, when I read it second time, I agreed with people who uh, basically said that you are making an argument that, uh, you know, uh, there is serious issue uh, in Indian democracy at the moment. What this essay gave me a chance, the Journal of Democracy, to basically make the argument on democracy in a comparative historical perspective. Yeah, I think uh, that essay may have been read in the context of the debate that was going at that time and you didn't intend to write it in that way. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the going on to that question about the historical lens and how should we see the present moment in a historical perspective and is there a moment in the past that this comes close to? Okay. So, let, let, me, let me say two, three things on this. First, on the question of recency bias and something you also alluded in your uh, introduction when you talked about multiple indices. In mm -hmm. fact, most of these indices have been created in last 10 years. They didn't exist like VDEM an economist intelligence unit didn't exist pre-2011, right? And so even... this was 2006, I think. Like what I'm trying to say that except Freedom House Core, which is older indices, like it was coded in 1980s, 1990s. These are all really yeah, these are very fairly new. Even the so, scarization is relatively yes. new. all in the 90s. Was. Yes. So someone sitting in 2014 and 15 is coding about countries in 1970s and 80s, right? And yes. And so what you are doing is basically you are look, sitting at the present moment and thinking of like whether a country was democratic on multiple indicators. 50, 60 years back. That's one problem, right? Second, of like democracy is a dynamic concept. Concept like democratic backsliding in itself is a dynamic uh, concept because it keeps changing. Now, if democracy is a dynamic concept, the measurement is a dynamic concept, even the conception what a democracy is or should be was very different 50 years ago. Yeah. is going to be very different 50 years from now. But what you are doing when you are coding, say, India of 1975, you are looking <laughs> at the current moment and current conception of democracy to code India of 1975, right? So, so there's one uh, issue there uh, when we are just taking uh, these indices as face value. And you've uh, pointed out this recent paper uh, where the authors actually analyze these democracy indices and they argue that if you look at the objective measure, uh, which is, say, uh, turnout and, and turnover of governments and many other such indicators because all these indices have multiple components. Some of those components are based on objective indicators. Some of them are based on subjective indicators. And the authors argue that if you just look at objective indicators, it seems that democracies across the globe are not doing that badly. Whereas if you just look at object, uh, sub, uh, subjective indicators, it would seem like a case that we are heading towards a catastrophe. And so one point they make in the paper is that it seems coders have become much more harsher. Their own expectation of what democracy is, is, is sort of like very high. The bar is really, really high. The argument that they seem to make is that the information sources that the coders are using huh. have a time varying bias. So more recent, there's been a lot more kind of uh, in the media talk about 
events that seem to be anti-democratic and so, so forth. And that coders are consuming that. And then basically, even if the definition of democracy is even the same, the information that they're using to code it is, uh, has absolutely, absolutely. Thank right. you for adding that. Uh, but if you like, just to come to your context uh, question on historical lens to Indian democracy, see, we all agree democracies are never perfect anywhere on the globe. And Indian democracy has also not been perfect. Uh, but so, so one, and, and many people would agree also on this, a large continental and size polity like India, so much diversity, uh, uh, poor, has to be also evaluated against its own benchmark. This is not to say we don't need to get into global comparison, right? Like I think everyone who's concerned about uh, India's democracy is their concern is not because of some conspiracy theory or they want to bring India down, uh, but also because many of these democracy watchers or scholars are really concerned about India uh, because India is a large country. Uh, if India goes on the democracy index, the global uh, the proportion of population globally not under democracy also uh, declines significantly. India being some of the, like, uh, you know, a poor, uh, a developing demo, uh, developing country uh, is also a role model for many countries across the uh, globe, especially in Africa and in uh, uh, Asia, that how uh, a post-colonial country can develop itself into a democratic form. And so I, I appreciate and empathize with those concerns. But I think what's happening is that the recency bias of what might have happened in last uh, uh, five, seven years, especially on the institutional front and some on other front, is basically getting blown out of proportion. I'm not saying institutions are not under stress. I'm not saying perhaps uh, uh, on, on certain other indicators, things might not have taken a hit. But that hit is not severe enough to say that Indian democracy is on the deathbed. <laughs> and if you look at... Uh, uh, the own trajectory of India's uh, journey from uh, 1947 till now, uh, uh, it, it has not been a linear trajectory, right? Uh, we have taken uh, uh, two steps forward in one direction and one step backward because as you rightly uh, uh, pointed out in your question, it's a, like a very diverse, you have multiple groups making demands from the state and all those demands cannot be accommodated at the same time. And like uh, even accommodation will not have same uh, means to get them. And so there are going to be moments when things are going to be tensed. Uh, some institutions are going to be under stress, but the cumulative of it, like uh, what I would say to call it that we are basically in a very, very serious uh, stage of democratic backsliding is an exaggeration. Uh, maybe I'm wrong on this question, but the evidence basically points to this. And I would be happy if, if, if people who are basically making the claim on democratic backsliding, they, they, they basically make this claim, which is that we don't have enough evidence as of now to say that India is basically in a very, very bad shape, but all indicators are pointing in that direction. So I like, once there is a sense of proportion to describe the current moment, I think there would be much more agreement. So uh, that answers one part of my question. The other part was just to take the historical lens and say, I mean, the Indian polity itself has gone through many transformations in the last <laughs> I mean, 73 years since the Republic was founded. And uh, uh, it, the present moment obviously cannot be compared with any other moment. Time sure. the context change, everything changes. But structurally, what are the uh, unique features of this moment? I mean, in the big ones in that mm -hmm. mind. And in which moment in the past comes closest to this? Okay, so the reason I perhaps avoided to answer the question uh, uh, a minute ago is because uh, you rightly pointed out in the question, if this moment in itself can't be exactly compared with that, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you think about just from the uh, party system lens, which is what I study uh, and wrote about it in this essay, the first party system was a Congress dominant system. But the opposition was so weak uh, in the first pa party system that you would like not hear what the opposition is. In fact, like Rajni Kothari's famous characterization of Congress system basically would call opposition <laughs> as uh, parties of uh, uh, pressure, whereas opposition uh, for Kothari was inbuilt within the Congress itself. Right. Uh, the second, pa second party system is again 
in some ways a congress dominant system though not as same as the first party system so from 67 to 89 what we are witnessing is that congress remains dominant nationally but in states started facing lots of challenges and so just from the electoral contest perspective the 2014 phase basically is much more similar in that sense that while the bjp looks dominant nationally in state it continues to lose election it it faces stiff competition uh, uh, and and opposition is 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 much more sort of like strong than what was in the first party system in the third party system which is what we called as coalition era the 89 to 2014 phase there were like dozens of parties which were uh, 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 which were part of the government uh, at any point of time and so many of the institutions like parliament uh, uh, became an important site for all kinds of bargaining and negotiation right and so so the eight, like what like so some of the institutions gain much more prominence in the 89 to 20 uh, 14 phase be it election commission be it parliament uh, be it, be be, be it, uh, other organizations is because the nature of political power was dispersed compared to what it was in the second party system and what it is in the fourth party system so <laughs> this takes me to your second argument that you make in in, in the essay which is about uh, how we are conflating different phenomena uh, and basically using them in a manner that is uh, not analytically very useful because if you want to understand one phenomenon on its own terms and another phenomenon on its own terms and see overlap that's useful and what way are they connected but if you conflate them together then it's perhaps not very useful analytically so let me explain <laughs> what i mean by that use the uh, there's a sentence from your ssm quoting systemic features of a dominant party system that is also marked by deep partisan polarization are being conflated with democratic backsliding then you say that we should examine the systemic changes associated with the rise of a new dominant party system that at its core was marked by the decline of an old elite compact this will help to explain why political grievances are spilling into the streets so this is the second argument that you make that we are conflating <laughs> a dominant party system which is marked by considerable polarization with democratic backsliding so how do you see conceptually these as different phenomenon okay like uh, how do you see the dominant party system can i uh, like what are, what is the relationship between a dominant party system acting in a certain way and democratic backsliding because i do see that there are some overlap possibly a dominant party system can behave in a manner that can lead to democratic backsliding as well right <laughs> so true, true. Yes. and this is where i think our conception of uh, democracy also needs to be tailored uh, uh, so so for example uh, Uh, a lot of people would argue that in the current moment bjp is not accommodative of allies and allies in this case is going to be uh, mostly regional interests right in the coalition era you would see regional players basically playing a very significant role at the central level they are form uh, they are uh, uh, they are a uh, part of the government and so this argument now basically gets stretched to that the federal compact in india is under deep threat right uh, uh, is it under strain yes but it's it's a feature of the dominant party system where when you have like a majority you don't need to uh, uh, bargain with with your allies in the same way uh, as you are going to be right and in that sense what happens the cause uh, and effect story basically gets uh, uh, twisted Uh, as if it's basically uh, the current set of leaders who are heading the government are anti-democratic in outlook. They might be, I don't know. Uh, but 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 even if, if these same leaders were heading the BJP in 1989 to 2014, they would have been negotiating with their allies in a very very different way. What they are doing now. Similarly, uh, 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 like a large part of the argument rests that now even the electoral field is very unequal. because uh, the bjp uh, uh, basically disproportionately has amassed uh, uh, campaign finance resources and has even used legal means to uh, deny ca- campaign finance resources to other parties now in a coalition party system those sort of people who are putting money are also not very sure who's going to win national election and so they are basically hedging their bets on <laughs> political players 
in a dominant party system, most uh, people who are putting campaign finance resources are also trying to be strategic. They know that this party is much more likely to win election. Mm -hmm. And so they are going to basically uh, 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 part with, with that party much more. Uh, and just to give you an example, government of the day always had advantage in campaign finance resources, period. Even the Congress party between 2004 and 14 had more resources uh, than the BJP. This started changing around 2013, the file data, which is uh, 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 with the Election Commission of India. And if you compare this moment, uh, the 2014 moment on the campaign finance uh, with the second party system, I forget about the first party system uh, and I think there are references second party system because it's documented Stanley Kochnik has written about briefcase politics and the kind of advantages uh, Congress used to have there is a quote by Atal Bihari Vajpayee that our party doesn't have enough money to even contest election uh, uh, right uh, and, and, and so the advantages what Congress had vis-a-vis -vis BJS of that time looks very similar what BJP has uh, with the uh, uh, against the Congress at that moment. So that's one aspect of uh, what dominant party system does. Second, I spoke about like parliament uh, becoming a site of negotiation, institutions able to assert their autonom autonomy because uh, the uh, governing party does not have that kind of uh, legislative majority. It can't just sort of like uh, uh, move everything that it wants uh, through the parliament without uh, uh, creating that kind of back channel conversations and trying to uh, bring uh, everybody uh, on board. Uh, third, I think there is a deep polarization that has taken place in the system. Some of it was slowly built. So I'm not saying the polarization got created in 2014 or after that. I think perhaps after late 1980s, uh, some of those things had started taking shape or, or the seeds were sown then. And now once you have a like a dominant party system with, uh, in 2014, which is also trying to replace the uh, existing sort of like elite order, uh, this polarization seems to have become much more visible. And so there's no denying the fact that, you know, BJP has an ideological agenda, which has uh, the religious access at its core. Uh, and so that ideological religious axis is now producing some sort of like ideological polarization, uh, which is where not just elites, but even uh, uh, we are seeing divisions in the mass uh, attitudes as well. And so good example of, of some of those things is like, uh, uh, and you may not agree and others may not agree with this, but think of it. Uh, if just as BJP came to power in 2014, there were sections and very important people uh, of this country started making this argument publicly uh, uh, that we are heading to an undeclared emergency, right? And so if you start crying wolf from the moment uh, uh, another party which does not share your ideological worldview comes to power, the party is also going to make some decisions that it's difficult to govern in such an atmosphere with these kind of voices and these voices have to be basically uh, put down uh, in some ways. And, and, and that's what seems to be happening, uh, where like any kind of, of, of conversation which can happen in, in uh, you know, uh, closed door conversation and like, what do we expect in, 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 in a democracy in, in this complex country uh, that there are going to be some sort of like like opposition and government at certain moments of time are going to work in tandem to run the complex country, right? There are going to be differences of opinion. They will express those differences in public, but they will find channels of communications to run the system. Now what has happened, the kind of, I think, energies that got unleashed in last five, seven years uh, in the run-up 2014 election, those kind of conversations have stopped. Uh, and, and that is because of many things. We can discuss it later, uh, but uh, those are some of the things that are happening. So I want to unpack different parts of your answer and try to understand uh, in somewhat deeper way, what do you mean by this? So one uh, phrase that we use is dominant party. Now, I can see at the level of the vote share, at the level of the number of MPs in the Lok Sabha, <laughs> why BGP would be called a dominant party. For now, but I want to understand for you as a political scientist, 
how deep do you think this dominance goes? Hmm. Because I mean, it's a long-standing result of, uh, of a, I mean, fact about Indian politics that party identification is not very significant here. Hmm. Fewer than 40% people identify with any party at all. Within those numbers, uh, some, I mean, more identify with BJP perhaps than other parties. So there is some advantage that it has, but vast majority of people do not, do not identify with any particular party. Hmm. So does that mean that this dominance is not a deep kind of dominance and it, it's uh, something that can change relatively more easily than it seems from the survey surface or uh, and what are the other kind of sources of data that you have in terms of understand the depth of this dominance? Okay. Uh, you're absolutely right that party identification in India is uh, not as strong as you might see in other uh, uh, democracies, more established democracies. There are less people who identify with uh, uh, any political party. Uh, but I, I think that has also to do slightly with the multiplicity of parties we have in our uh, system. But what is happening in our system, like especially like I, uh, we do this survey with YouGov and Mint, uh, now have started actually tracking uh, identification in much more uh, detail, which is not just I ask you which party you identify with, but I ask a set of four questions to measure the strength of identification. So, for example, one question is if, like, you first I ask you which party you identify with, and the second question is uh, a set of four questions, which includes if someone talks nice things about this party, do you associate with that person? Right. And so, so, so that basically gets at the strength of identification. What seems to be happening in India? We don't have long term data on this, but in the last two, three years, uh, partisanship is actually increasing, increasing to an extent that it's correlated with how we see everything around us. And so to play those who are more partisan, they say that they have developed strains in their personal relationship because of their political views. Partisan people have a very different uh, view of uh, uh, what democracy is for them, right? And so, in fact, in one survey, we asked uh, certain questions related to democracy, like, would you be okay if the system is run by experts rather than politicians, if there is a military uh, running the system and all those things? The differences are not between if you vote for BJP, if you vote for Congress, or if you vote for left. The differences are between the strong partisans of mm. every party versus weak partisans, meaning that we basically want our ilk to come to power, even if we have to sort of like uh, uh, forego certain democratic uh, values and norms, not just in the realm of politics, but like we, in one survey, we actually asked, like gave name of four uh, uh, Bollywood personalities, uh, Shah Rukh Khan, Akshay Kumar, Deepika Padukone, and uh, Kangana Ranaut. And, and there is partisan division on uh, who they like. Uh, so, in popular culture, in one survey, we actually asked about leaders uh, of, from history, Nehru, Ambedkar, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose, Patel, and Gandhi. And there was actually division on that as well. So this partisan worldview is actually shaping how we look different things uh, around us. And, and, and before you um, go on, just to clarify, well, how big is this partisanship? Like what percent of the respondents would you identify as a deeply partisan in, in uh, codification? So, so, so one in comparison to the data that you quoted, largely is national election studies. Yes. So it's across uh, uh, country, so right? 70s. The data which I am using, the YouGov Mint uh, uh, CPR survey, is largely an urban online bank. Right. So th these two sets of uh, data in their sam like, uh, sample representativeness is not very similar. Uh, but uh, even this uh, YouGov survey is very large, 10,000 done every six months right uh, across the country. So it's urban online sample. Uh, but I would say in this data, we have more than uh, 60 to 65 percent people who identify with uh, a, a political party. So slightly high comparison to NES. And more than one third of people are actually strong partisans. So we categorize them in strong partisan, weak partisan, and not partisan at all. Yeah, actually, the national election studies is hard to say what that survey is capturing because the mm -hmm. question that is asked is, do you feel close to any party? Yes. So that includes 
maybe some partisans who are not strong partisans will say no to that because they don't feel close to that ha. and some will so it's hard to actually interpret that and and, and, so. and just to add to uh, the discussion which we are having suyesh uh it actually may not matter how large the size of of of, of this party is yeah because this is uh very uh, sort of loud and they have voice and so they may be uh, uh, sort of like pulling things uh, apart uh, on two uh, extreme uh, ends that takes me to the second part of your answer which i want to unpack for there is a polarization question that i mean i completely agree with you that political landscape is deeply polarized right now so you see this in terms of size of power at the central level but also state level hmm. so if it's a non bjp government what it thinks it can do to the bjp <laughs> at the state level like we saw i don't name any particular state but there are states in which there is some amount of violence and use of state power and all <laughs> happening in the the norms of what you can do to the other side is now shifted it seems i mean again, this is a subjective indicator not a <laughs> objective indicator <Yeah. laughs> it seems to me that has happened and the rhetorically also people feel that if Uh, their side is uh, doing something it is more acceptable other side is doing mm-hmm. it is certainly at the party and factional level maybe among the elites also there is some bit, bit significant ideological polarization mm-hmm. and there are deeper reasons for it because our founding moment had a particular set of ideological kind of uh, <laughs> clustering mm-hmm. which uh, made its way into the constitution in some ways and our constitution is not just a procedural document mm-hmm. it is a very substantive document has a lot of specific values coded into it mm. so in the this code on code new republic mm. uh, obviously different voices are coming up yeah. and in many ways there are, some of those voices are actually uh, uh, voices that took shape in opposition to that in the initial settlement yes. and took a long time to two and a half generations to come to power so you will see some of this unsettling kind of an experience that elites go through uh, that a particular settlement is being undone that i am not very surprised about and i we do experience that on a day to day basis what i am more concerned about and i want to understand from you is the question of mass polarization mm. whether the society itself at large and obviously indian society is so large each state may having different experiences but since some you are someone who accesses a large number of data sets you do a lot of reading of the political and science literature what are you seeing on that and what are the main axes of polarization <laughs> first i think and this is again hunch so subjective i think if we start measuring so because we have been measuring identification in nes much more at the time of national election my hunch is that if we do in state uh, around state elections uh, we might see a greater identification and the reason why i'm saying this say for example a large part of south and east during national elections their stake is very very different right and so so once we start measuring this attachment in in state politics we might get a slightly greater degree of identification and uh, greater levels of polarization in a continental size polity uh, it would be hard to reduce uh uh of course for pol- like you know writing political science journals and books you have to be much more parsimonious yes, it would be hard to figure out uh two or three axes on which uh, the system is polarized of course there are some visible uh, 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 indicators right and and there are uh, many more uh, sort of like uh, like at, at mass level at least on the axis of uh, religion uh, axis of caste axis of region uh, there is a higher degree of polarization but when we when i talk about say axis of caste it's not basically just a very sociological frame of caste where the polarization is mm-hmm. polarization is actually on the political frame of, of of caste even on the religion there is definitely some degree of uh, prejudice against muslims uh, in many parts of the country but even there uh, i would argue that uh, uh, the polarization on religion axis has also political component and some of the historical settlements or negotiated settlement on the religion and caste axis mm-hmm. at our foundational moment uh, you know uh, basically uh, were not debated enough uh, 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 or or not discussed enough like we were partition on the uh, on on the on the religion uh, lines though it, like india's founding fathers don't agree to two nation theory uh uh but at least uh, at the matter of fact the division took place between uh uh, uh, uh like uh those uh, uh uh 
who went to Pakistan uh, or uh, Bangladesh were largely Muslims, right? Of course, some Hindus stayed there and large, larger population of Muslims stayed here. But uh, no doubt that uh, uh, there is a deep uh, sort of division on, on, on that action. So I think on the social uh, front, some of these divisions have remained important. <coughs> of course, now newer divisions might be coming up, like how to accommodate different groups into the body politic, what kind of like... Uh, uh, accommodation we are going to uh, uh, have for women in mainstream body politics, but also in other uh, kinds of things. So, so, so on that's on the social axis. Uh, we don't have the similar kind of market versus state division uh, in India. Uh, uh, perhaps there was some disagreements on the nature of welfare state in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, I think some of those disagreements, uh, maybe uh, a small section of, of, of uh, upper middle class uh, professionals may have a very different worldview of what the nature of welfare state in India should be. But largely, I think the political class seems to have agreed on uh, that. So, so, so it's hard for me to at this moment answer uh, like what kind of uh, uh, axes uh, the polarization is uh, taking place. But it's like partisan level, it's definitely increasing uh, and it's shaping our uh, world. Yeah, because it uh, does matter. Obviously, the uh, partisan politics is very important and the way in which different uh, voices get heard and incorporated. Not everybody will be heard and get incorporated on an ongoing basis. You will not have everything that you want be included in the decision-making process. But there should be ways in which you are at least heard and then, I mean... Uh, the, then you feel that you're part of the process in, in some ways. For example, the example I often give is that uh, you don't need to uh, match the population share of a particular group with the number of MPs in the parliament to see whether you're representative. It's a process of representation. So yes. in 1952, we had fewer Muslim MPs than we do now. Huh. So it does, doesn't mean that <laughs> Muslims are not getting incorporated in the, in the uh, Indian politics in the 50s. And uh, even if you had a higher uh, share of MPs today, Muslim MPs, then it wouldn't mean that they are getting more <laughs> incorporated today. Mm -hmm. It's more of a process of getting incorporation and through the formal lawmaking process, but also in terms of the informal processes of conversation and discussion that politicians have with their uh, constituents and the open debate that people have in the civil society and so on. So on this, uh, one question that I want, want to have is that dominant party, as you rightly said, has less incentive to incorporate regional parties because why? You know, you, you want a single party majority, you don't need to form coalition. In fact, in many ways, they neglect their own old standing uh, coalition yeah. partners also. So similarly, sometimes in the internal process of decision making, they will leave certain voices out. Sometimes for ideological reasons, some for just the fact that they have limited cognitive capacity to consider only a few of the uh, 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 few of the voices and they don't have the necessity to listen to the more voices. Then in that context, protests happen, right? Because mm. if the formal lawmaking process is not yes. uh, working for you in a democracy, you would go and protest. And in the last nine years, we have seen quite a few protests, significant protests. Started off with the one rank, one pension uh, protests. More recently were the farm law protests. In between, there were significant CA protests. And what I see is that in many of the cases, actually, the dominant party did relent. Mm. I mean, there were concessions made. Mm. Arm laws were the biggest concession in some ways. OROP, there was concession made. Even CA, you would argue that there was a certain conception in the mind of the protester that CA plus NRC <laughs> would be done in a particular way. None of that has panned out. I don't know what the, what the inside story is, but it seems that there was some kind of a, at least delay on, uh, on, on, on that front, maybe because of the protest, maybe other reasons. So the dominant party is dominant and it is obviously making decisions based on the power it has. But there are, at least in the Indian democracy, outside of the formal lawmaking process, that's uh, these kind of mechanisms, which are expensive in many ways, because protests can be very expensive, they can be disruptive. But they seem to be giving uh, uh, gaining traction with the government in, yeah. in, in some ways and able to get things from, from the government. So how do you see this? As, first, do you agree with this kind of assessment of the protests in the last nine years? Or am I just only cherry picking? No, no, no. Absolutely. Cherry picking? Or, and if so, then if you do agree, then uh, uh, how do you see this as, uh, I mean, uh, uh, scoring for Indian democracy? You know? 
No, thank you, Suresh, for asking this question and elaborating on it because uh, you had earlier asked about the features of dominant party system and somehow that got lost. So this question actually gives me a chance to answer that. Uh, to my opinion, uh, dominant party system has certain features. Of course, it has some level of electoral uh, uh, dominance. Uh, so that's one feature. But with that, there are three or four other things that come. So you will have electoral dominance. That does not mean that you will win all elections, but you will be like the dominant party will be basically the focal point of competition. All kinds of alignment and uh, realignment will take place against uh, or in favor of the dominant party. Second, there's no dominant party uh, 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 that has existed is without an organizational machine on the ground. Right. And so this machine will be basically able to <coughs> pass on its messages much more rapidly and, and much more uh, in depth. And so that's why, like, uh, even in terms of like uh, messaging and kind of political culture argument that we make that is changing is because it's also like there is an organizational machine uh, uh, which is present, not just for electoral purposes, but also for uh, uh, sort of like garnering uh, 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 sort of like favorable opinion on its ideological uh, uh, issues. Mm -hmm. So that's the third feature of a dominant party system that there would be an ideological, uh, I don't know the word would be hegemony, but that will also get much more uh, 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 place in the system. So even the opposition parties in some way will start trying to mirror the dominant party in its strategy and tactics because the median uh, vote has, uh, has shifted. So that's the third feature. Fourth, dominant parties are also presided by a charismatic leader at the top. Now, you might uh, agree or not agree with the leader. You might find him popular or unpopular because when you have a charismatic at the leader at the top, you it's, it's natural that some of the features we call centralizing tendencies, that will become sort of like exaggerated. Because like on everything you will see the leader, right? And 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 so so that's the fourth feature of the dominant party system. And fifth feature, which I keep saying that it's a feature of the system that the opposition will remain fragmented. It becomes harder for opposition players to come together because the costs are higher. In the first party system also, and even in the second party system, it was very very difficult for opposition players to come together and fight elections, right? And 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 seventy seven is only one successful example. <laughs> Because then the threats were sort of like uh, of a very different order or nature. It was an existential threat. And so that's why opposition parties find it hard to come together. Uh, they, they remain disunited, fragmented. There is much like lesser, there, there is lesser coherence. And all of this actually adds to the point on your protest. Because one, dominant party is in that position that it will always negotiate from strength. The opposition parties, because they are not able to voice the concerns of grievances of the citizens in the parliamentary or formal forums, they get for the weekend. And so then the voices on the ground will have to find more channels outside the formal process. And so those grievances then will keep spilling on the streets, what we are basically calling as, as protests, right? And so frequency of protest in a dominant party system is much more likely to increase. Uh, of course, the government will have to relent at the end of the day. Like they, they are also concerned about the electoral cost of some of these. Uh, uh, yeah, but they could uh, also suppress. So yes, they, they, could, they could also the suppress. The they could also elongate this, yeah. right? And so, so that's why, uh, like many of these protests were sort of like six months or a year long protests because uh, government could also keep thinking that we we have time, right? Before we basically have to uh, uh, budge in, but. They are not able to suppress, uh, and this is very important uh, 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 because because there is uh, some uh, level of democracy, even if I have to use the word some, because they know that if, if they go too far, I, I don't think there is uh, in, like any sort of like uh, 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 popular sanction uh, to uh, suppress uh, protest, right? Even when you would like... Uh, 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 call this uh, government and in some ways it has not done enough uh, on the question of Muslims. In fact, it has been negative on this question. I don't think there is a popular support for uh, 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 what like uh, uh, doing like there's no popular support for violence uh, against Muslims. Now, popular when I basically talk of, about mass attitudes, of course, uh, within the uh, uh, sort of like uh, deep 
sympathizers of the party, there may be some attitudes on, on that front. Yeah, I mean, um, the Pew survey, the famous Pew survey on religion in India, were basically called you know, uh, that uh, Indians live segregated lives, but they tolerate each other. Yes, so yes. It is not that they want to harm each other. They want you stay and you practice your own religion, and whatever it may be, and I, I'll do the same. Mm. And there's not much support for intermingling and all of mm. that. So it is not, uh, I mean, I, I, it's not like a liberal kind of a, a tolerance where any, pretty much intermingling and mixing, mixing of uh, traditions and values is accepted. It's more segregated. But there is tolerance of this kind. Yes. Because you will not accept uh, active, you know, uh, uh, action against... Uh, yeah. Their, uh, yeah. No, on, the, in, in all of these surveys, like though people would say, uh, 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 you know, uh, in many parts of the country, uh, 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 and some of those were alleged criminals on which BJP governments in those states used... Uh, bulldozers uh, uh, against the alleged criminals family and other things. The median voter is not supportive of, of, of some of these acts in the survey. But it's also like to figure out that it, this act is also not going to turn their vote against the BGP. They may or may not. Yeah, may or may not. But this is like they don't say that, oh, great, uh, go ahead and do it. Right? Yeah, I they, mean, it's a voting is such a, uh, it's a complex, complex it's Everything goes into that one yeah, decision. Yeah, so yeah. Uh, how much weight is given to what is hard to say. It's very difficult to measure it also. The third argument that you make in your essay, I just want to continue the line that we started, is to look at the review of public opinion. We did discuss it briefly in different ways, but not in this particular angle to it, is that the looking at public surveys, public opinion surveys gives us a clearer picture of what the people think about the Indian democracy. And you quote some of the surveys also. And I also, in some of my writings, quoted this. There is a big disconnect between the scholarly discourse on Indian democracy and the public surveys on Indian democracy. Can you tell us about that? What, what is how so, this is uh, This is one light of argument which can also be critiqued and some people have also critiqued uh, this. That in public opinion surveys, mm -hmm. when you ask people uh, about uh, whether democracy is increasing or decreasing, even if a large portion of people are saying that democracy has increased, their conception about what democracy is going to uh, uh, vary a lot. Uh, and and uh, the public opinion surveys uh, information in the piece is also linked to the polarization argument uh, uh, I was uh, making. But more importantly, in the paper uh, uh, where I actually <laughs> cited two papers because there was not much space, I just wrote in uh, one line about each of those papers and something which you had asked me. Uh, during our initial conversation today is about these overlapping category. So when people like scholars are making an argument about uh, democratic backsliding, they are connecting it to large number of political science or social science concept. There's a backsliding happening. Populist leaders are at the fore. Uh, it's a Hindu na uh, nationalist onslaught uh, against uh, uh, religious minorities, right? So uh, basically, you're overlapping populism, democratic backsliding, Hindu nationalism, all of these categories and many more. Conceptually, they also look same and similar. To some extent. Yes, to some extent, right? But you can have one without the other. Yes. There are some areas where you can have one without the other. Yes. And that's what makes them distinct. I yes. Mean. Like most of these writings, all of these terminologies are going together. Right? I don't want to name names, but uh, you can think of like uh, uh, the writings on populism in India, on Hindu nationalism in India, on democratic backsliding in India in the last five years. And all of these categories have been used in those essays. Whereas the survey actually points out that these are actually distinct phenomena, mm. right? So interesting thing, what might be happening with the BJP, uh, it's based on just one survey, so I don't want to go overboard. The like incoming BJP voter is slightly more majoritarian uh, and less religious, mm. uh, uh, right? Whereas, uh, and then other survey, both conducted by Lokniti CSDS, basically says that Hindu nationalism in the country and populism are two distinct phenomena. Now, the paper makes an argument on the uh, Hindu nationalism and populism that this is like might be overlapping categories at the elite level, but not in the mass survey. Now, for the elite level, we don't have the evidence, right? We don't have 
uh, uh, either sort of like large number of interviews uh, uh, that they basically talk of some of these things in the same breath uh, or or some survey data. What is true, uh, and this is what Pradeep and I also mentioned in our book, some of these things were overlapping categories at the founding of our republic. Right, uh, the Hindu nationalists and those who were, who were against caste reservations and and all of those things were very similar kind of leaders. They were making like all these arguments together. But now, with the expansion of democracy, with the expansion of BJP, BJP's own vote base and leadership base is changing. Some of these things are becoming distinct phenomena. And and I think to understand the current moment of Indian politics and Indian democracy, we need to unpack a bit more on how these are distinct phenomena. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> and these have to be, uh, I mean, this level of unpacking is very important because, see, this populism, populism stands in the history of democracies. Hmm. And you can have a populist politics without democratic backsliding. Yes. And that makes it, uh, I mean, interesting to look at whether it is populism at all. If it is populism, then is it uh, coming with democratic backsliding? Hmm. Certain kind of uh, nationalist politics itself need not necessarily be associated with populism or <laughs> democratic backsliding. Yes. It can happen Absolutely. without that as well. Absolutely. So, and similarly, other phenomena that are getting kind of completed. Now I want to move towards a, I mean, a different segment of this conversation, just to understand how you see the Indian democracy <laughs> right now. So a uh, couple of years ago, after the CA protests and all, Professor Subrata Mitra had written this short essay in which he had suggested that India is a middle democracy, you know. Okay. It is not like a full-fledged democracy, like some of the uh, frontier democracies in uh, Nordic countries and all, which uh, which are rated very, very high on democracy. But it's also not a hybrid, hybrid regime. It's somewhere in between. And basically, he had put it on certain constraints with the Indian state operates, the Indian, the Indian polity, the kind of challenges faces because of which it's stuck in the middle democracy trap. So he wasn't saying that he was disagreeing with those who were saying that India has devolved into a hybrid regime. But he was also disagreeing with those who were saying that Indian democracy is as good as any other democracy. So in some ways, in fact, the economist ranking of India is something where he was, that it's kind of a flawed democracy. It has its challenges, but it's certainly not a hybrid regime. So where do you think Indian democracy is in that sense? That's one part of the question. The other part I want to ask is about the transformations happening in the democracy, especially in terms of voting patterns and the kind of uh, changes we've seen in the last nine years, which have created this kind of a... Uh, upheaval in the order in some senses, right? You're saying that elite compact is shifting. The changes, uh, the basis of that is electoral changes uh, uh, because people are supporting different kind of parties than they did earlier. And how are these things connected? So first about the state of Indian democracy, according to you. Okay. Uh, uh, so it's going to be a long winded answer. Uh, I would tend to agree with uh, uh, Professor Mitra's classification of India being a uh, middle democracy. Uh, and, and I want to remind everyone uh, uh, that uh, we have to also uh, remember the stack, uh, the odds that were stacked against India uh, in 1947. No one even thought at that time that we could even be a democracy, forget about a middle level democracy. Not just in 1947, till 1960s, there were doomsday prediction about uh, India's grand experiment of developing itself as a democracy is going to surely fail. So somehow, uh, we have uh, uh, succeeded in, in uh, uh, overcoming some of those doomsday predictions. But that does not mean that, uh, uh, and, 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 and this is where perhaps we got lost. Uh, once we uh, uh, succeeded in overcoming those doomsday predictions, in 90s and 2000s, if you look at lots of writings on Indian democracy, acquired a celebratory nature, yeah. right? Uh, in, 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 in fact, uh, 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 Anderson, uh, what I am forgetting, historian, uh, uh, he wrote a set of three essays in London, uh, a book of reviews where he actually uh, critiqued lots of uh, uh, books on Indian democracy uh, uh, that were written in uh, 1990s. Perry Anderson. Perry. Uh, right? Uh, <laughs> so I think we became too celebratory. This is not to say that there's nothing to learn from India's journey as a democracy. Given the, like all the odds that were stacked against it, given our diversity, given our continental size quality, given the uh, illiteracy or, or, or uh, large segment of population actually dependent on state for their 
well-being. Uh, forget about their upward mobility, just to be able to uh, uh, survive in a decent uh, uh, fashion. Uh, given all those complexity, I would say that India has done fairly uh, well. Uh, now, some of these things are at any point like now, 70 years is a long journey. Some of these sort of like things are going to change. Uh, some may change for good and some may also change for bad. And that's where uh, at every moment, those who are interested in, in, in the India project would have to be watchful, right? I'm not saying everything is uh, perfect at the moment. There are serious areas of, of concern and we need to be watchful uh, uh, at, at uh, every moment. And, and we also have to remember that, uh, you know, we'll take two steps forward, one step backward, and we have to be concerned both uh, not to over celebrate the two steps and not to basically uh, uh, over exaggerate the uh, one step backward. It's an, uh, uh, in some ways, if you ask me what my conception of democracy is, it's basically a negotiated settlement between multiple groups of the society where everyone has say, right? And, and at any point of time, everyone is not going to have equal say. And sometimes those negotiated settlements are going to change, right? And so the moment of change should not be interpreted uh, as it is being interpreted now. Uh, second point, uh, and I think uh, which is uh, related to uh, the transformations and the changes that are taking place in India. And, and let's talk just about the elite level because it's also concerned to the uh, one theme which we have been talking about, the old elite compact, uh, which is uh, basically uh, uh, very recently there is a, a, a book by uh, uh, Sanjay Baru uh, on India's changing uh, uh, elite, right? Uh, and, and, and if you read that uh, uh, book, you'll figure out what... Uh, 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 Dr. Baru has done uh, uh, in a very accessible way. Basically, he says that if you look at various domains, be it in military, be it in bureaucracy, be it politics, be it, uh, you know, the cultural elite, the composition of these elites are changing. None of these changes started just in 2040, right? Like uh, if you think about the caste composition uh, uh, changing in terms of both bureaucracy and politics, that dates back. Some of it starts in 1970s, but the process uh, starts much more after 1990s. Once you have Mandel Commission recommendation in place, and then 2005, you have second Mandel uh, 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 recommendation coming in. So the nature of elite uh, uh, composition is undergoing a change. What 2014 does with that elite composition undergoing change, it also brings a new set of political elites in the system, right? And, and, and so these political elites are now, I don't think a new elite compact has been set. The new negotiated settlement has been set. At the moment, the new political elite, and given India's sort of like institutional structure, those who are in political power have a greater say in the system. Uh, right. And, and, and so at the moment, uh, what, uh, this, uh, new political, <laughs> uh, some of it might be true, not true, but it seems to me they have basically, uh, you know, imbibed certain things. First is that there was an old elite, uh, uh, from, uh, Nehru, uh, to now which has captured all kinds of institutions uh, and they continue to serve the interest of the Congress party or the Congress party elites in some ways. And we need to beat the old elite out uh, 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 to create a new system. Now, in doing so, many times I would say they go overboard, mm -hmm. right? They become reactionary. Uh, 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 in some ways, some of it might be true, but some of this might get exaggerated, right? Like the like to call all old uh, elite as sort of like self-serving elites and not interested in India project is is basically anti-national. Uh, yeah, anti-national. To going to the extent of anti-national is 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 very uh, 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 sort of like uh, dangerous idea. Yeah. Uh, uh, but that's what the regime seems to have uh, imbibed uh, uh, at the moment, and. The, the, in some ways, uh, and, and Baru, in fact, that's why he uh, uses this phrase. Uh, uh, he compares it to the uh, uh, Mao movement of, of, of 1990s as if like uh, a revolutionary change uh, is happening where everything that is old needs to be thrown out and it has to be replaced with new. And I think because the rupture is happening at such a fast pace, uh, it's creating a lot of anxiety. And some of those anxiety is basically getting expressed 
uh, in, in very exaggerated uh, terms. It is possible that uh, 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 the rupture can actually lead to uh, very negative outcomes for India in future. I am not able to see that at, at that moment. Uh, uh, that is where I am uh, about the current moment in Indian democracy. Yeah, and whether it will or not depends on how well India is functioning as a democracy. <laughs> yes. <laughs> as you said, it is a negotiated settlement and in which different voices can be heard. Maybe not always accepted, but heard and sometimes accepted. So everybody has a chance to yeah. play, play in this uh, system and hope to win sometimes, hope to accommodate on the other times and sometimes even <laughs> lose lose the argument. So that that's the way the process works. Mm. So let me uh, ask you a final question. Um, uh, are you hopeful about Indian democracy? Yes, the, maybe the eternal optimist uh, in me is saying this. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful about Indian democracy and India project. But this is not just like optimism without any uh, evidence. If you look at different parts of Indian politics, Indian economy, Indian democracy, uh, there is much more dynamism. Uh, there is much more sort of like changes that are taking place in the positive direction. and and. Just to give you like a couple of examples, and, and it, 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 of course, some of these are going to be sent, like you know, uh, uh, interpreted differently by different people. I think, like, let's take the position uh, or status of scheduled caste in the society. I think more positive things have happened for this community in the last twenty five years mm -hmm. than it has happened over past many centuries. Uh, right. This is not to say now they are like in, in a perfect world, right? But things have changed much more significantly uh, for this group. Similarly for women, right? There is a lot more seems to be happening now. Uh, they are uh, getting into colleges, uh, uh, getting into like uh, important positions uh, of power. Uh, of course, the pace of change is slow, uh, and then much much more needs to be done on 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 that front. Uh, economy. Yes, there is economic concern in, in the country. Uh, uh, there is lots of unemployment. Uh, but I, I also think uh, inequalities uh, uh, might have been uh, increasing in certain parts of the country. But overall, I think uh, our economic situation has improved uh, in the last 30 years uh, 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 than it had uh, previously. Of course, I, and I think that there is going to be a disagreement uh, uh, with some people who would say we're basically using this 30 year framework, right? So in the 20 years, things move more positive, and in the last 10 years, things have basically uh, gone down. And I think, I, I don't think that has happened. Uh, uh, yes, the pace of uh, those changes might have slowed a bit, not a lot. But it's also uh, to do with many more things uh, 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 in, in, in the wider uh, global uh, political economy. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I'm not trying to say that all those <laughs> things, uh, like the slowness of these things, the rate of change, uh, so to say, is just because of pandemic or global economic uh, headwind. Yes, the government of the day also bears some responsibility. But to negate everything, and put all the blames uh, on the government of the day uh, would also be not fair. Yes, as citizens of this country, we can't hold the pandemic accountable or, or global economic headwind accountable. We have to hold uh, uh, the government of the day accountable. And, and, and so the hope that I have, uh, because what elections in India have time and again shown, uh, even in state election, even in this dominant party system, that if our leaders are not going to govern, and govern properly, they will not be elected to power. And and so and that is the I mean, the most basic definition of democracy. Yes, is that the people will decide. And yes, I mean you can add more bells and whistles to it, but that is at its core. And if they don't perform, they moved out of office. Yes. So I think my main takeaway from your essay and this conversation is that we should not conflate different concepts, <clears throat> and we should describe things as they are. So in addition to what you described. I'll also say a few uh, of these kinds of conflations that I see. One is that certain state actions are equated with decline of democracy. In India, state has, for the, all of its history, acted in certain ways when it's, it's seen necessity of you know coercive action. So, for example, there's a database on sedition cases. Mm. And the largest number of sedition cases were filed in 2011 because it, there were a lot of protests. And whenever protests happen and the state seems to be losing 
control it goes ahead and uh, files sedition case in fact the sedition law survived the entire coalition era you know <laughs> because the state finds it very useful sometimes mm-hmm. and i i hope we can find better ways to you know uh, handle large scale protests and so so forth but it doesn't mean that democracy itself in india has changed mm-hmm. similarly there is electoral domination which may be temporary because mm-hmm. people may change their mind and someone else but it's a temporary phenomenon does that mean they you, we should say that there is structural change in democracy itself further as i alluded earlier also the ideological realignments happening mm. and ideologies by their very nature are exclusionary to some extent they are because they privilege certain kind of uh, interests and ideas and marginalize others so you will have to find ways in which to see how this ideology is becoming more adaptive and how it's accommodating more and more whether it's not or not may in the long run have a impact on the health of democracy itself but it's still an open question it depends on how indian people what signals they send to the <laughs> party that are in power and so on so these are different uh, phenomenon but they many of them have a bearing on democracy and we need to see w- in what way it is functioning and i think generally i i would agree with you that this what you call exaggerated death of indian democracy is not helpful i mean it's not analytically helpful in the scholarly discourse but it also is in a perverse way kind of a power worship uh, mm-hmm. where you seem to suggest that somebody has much more power than they actually do you know <laughs> and then then when election comes then suddenly it seems like they don't have that much power and they have lot more vibrancy and openness with democracy mm. so but yeah i mean we don't know maybe things are worse than they appear to us and they may be better than those they appear to others so it's an open conversation and we should in the spirit of that conversation i just want to mention to our listeners that rahul they say the general democracy that we discussed today is uh, one of the five essays that they carried in a in the late latest issue uh, the other four essays are also worth reading and i it's a very good thing that they have diverse viewpoints uh, coming into that uh, issue of the journal uh, the other essays are written by maya tudor uh, tipur daman singh sumit ganguly and vinita yadav and uh, if you read all the five essays you get a fairly good and uh, diverse viewpoint on this and some of them are very much supportive of the democratic sliding backsliding view some are less uh, tipur daman has put a, a historical perspective on it and uh, i think rahul has done that plus other arguments that we discussed today so i would strongly recommend spending some time in reading the whole issue and getting these different perspective on the indian democracy thank you for taking time to talk to us rahul thank you suyash for this uh, very enriching conversation i learned a lot a lot from your question and it also you know uh, makes me think on some of the answers that i gave uh, some of them may not have been uh you know complete answers but hopefully i'll think more on they were complete enough for us <laughs> i learned a lot from this podcast thank, thank you. you so we'll be back soon with a new episode to make sure you don't miss it be sure to subscribe on apple podcast spotify stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts to learn more about our research and team you can visit us at carnegieindia.org You can also find us on social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and LinkedIn. Thank you for listening. See you next time.